So, hello friends. So I'll just give a brief overview on this particular <clears throat> nice topic. So if you recall, I've already done uh, quite a few series on ultrasound. Uh, the recent one, the last one, the preceding one that I did was focus in cardiac arrest. So right now it looks like there's focus in anything and everything. So this is a focus in weaning failure, uh, but we're very useful for trainees, uh, which, which they have put in that as an acronym called ABCD approach, ABCD. So you can pay attention mainly to ABCD. E is maybe uh, an extension of this. Uh, so, so the the topics that I'll be covering is pretty much uh, intuitive to most of the listeners, which we are doing anyway, but they've just packaged it and called it as ABCD. So you can just keep it for your own reference uh, to approach this subject in a little systematic way. Uh, so it, ABCD, E is an acronym which stands for two things. A stands for aeration score, B stands for below diaphragm, C stands for cardiac ultrasound, D stands for diaphragmatic. So independently, we have covered this in various other videos that I have done. So we have just packaged it as a sort of a systematic approach towards the assessing for weaning. So what is A? A stands for aeration score and pleural effusion. So basically, when you are assessing a patient for weaning to be extubated, we are meant to look at the lung aeration score and pleural effusion. So obviously, all my intensive care trainees are very proficient in doing this lung ultrasound. We look, we look for A pattern, then we look for B lines. And the normal aeration, if you have a normal A pattern, you give it a zero score. And if you have B lines with 7 millimeter sort of a spacing between them, so which means there is some pulmonary edema, it is not severe enough, so you, you would call it as interstitial edema, you give a aeration score of 1. And if it is more diffuse, where the separation is less than 3 millimeter, it is suggestive more of alveolar edema, which means the aeration is more severely affected. So you would give a score of aeration score of 2. And then if there is a proper sort of a consolidation, then you give it 3. So this is because consolidation with a shred sign, with or without air bronchogram, you give it as 3. So you basically, I'm sure all of you would be doing this. So you are just trying to stratify it with scoring and then look if there is consolidation and then you have to also look whether there is pleural effusion. So obviously, so these are some of the pictures you would have seen. So if you see, this is the... Uh, I would, I, you would give an aeration score of 1 where the separation is around 7 millimeter. So if you look at this video, where there are more comets, you would see here, you can see the separation is less than 3 millimeter. Uh, so you would possibly give an aeration score of around 2. Okay, so this is fairly intuitive, I'm sure. And if you see something like this, where there is a dense consolidation, here you see air bronchogram, you give an aeration score of 3. But mind you, when you talk about aeration score, lung ultrasound, you put this score for each zone. So every lung has upper zone, mid zone and lower zone. So it becomes 36 score for each. So you have six total score into each zone. So 18 on each side. So it becomes total of 36 scores. Then you have to score it. If it is more than 17, it portends extubation failure. If it is less than 30, it is found to be a good, good enough sort of a situation where extubation you could go ahead and extubation and in all likelihood, it would lead to success. So this is what we call as A in the ABCD acronym of weaning. And if you do not want to score C, you mainly, I'm sure most of you, I can put my hand on my chest. It, is, it takes a lot of time to do every zone and stratify this. The more simpler way is look for more confluent B lines. If B lines are more than six or the separation is, is less than three millimeter, uh, you know, three centimeters. So then obviously, you know that uh, you cannot extubate, you have to dry the lung. So I think you can keep it in that format to keep it a little more simpler. Uh, with regard. Otherwise, you, if you want to do it in a detailed way as a part of the study, then you have to do aeration score in each zones and then look into the scoring, whether it's more than 17 or less than 30. And after you do the aeration score, then obviously you have to look for pleural effusion. I'm sure all my intensive care people are very proficient. But the key thing is when you do pleural effusion, measure the quantity. And it's very simple. You just take 20, you remember the number 20, and you multiply it with the distance, the maximum distance of the pleural effusion. Uh, in, and that will give you the quantification. Why it is needed is because if your quantity is more than 500 ml, see, if it is less than 
340 ml, if it is 17 millimeter, means it is less than 340 ml, then it should not lead to too much of uh, sort of a indication that you would want to drain it to optimize weaning. So obviously, if it is more than 340 ml or if it is less than 340 ml, it even becomes inaccurate to measure the fluid. So if it is more than 340, so we keep it as roughly around 500 ml, then obviously you may have to consider whether tapping has to be done to optimize weaning. So if you keep that in the, so aeration is, you look into the sort of aeration score of 17 or 13 or look into B lines more than 6, very simplistically, and look for plural epithelium if it is more than 500. Uh, so that would uh, possibly give you some sort of a semblance that you may have to consider at least drainage if you are foreseeing uh, weaning failure. So just a few images about pleural effusion. I mean, uh, I'm sure most of you know, there are separate videos that I have as to how you visualize pleural effusion, where you keep the probe, so on and so forth. Okay, so we finished A. Okay, A, B, C, D approach. So B is below the diaphragm. I think just to make the ac acronym more easier to recall, they've included B. B is below the diaphragm. Basically, you have to put your curvilinear probe into the abdomen and see if there is ascites. Because if there is a large ascites, uh, then it may obviously impede your sort of a weaning possibility. And look for any abscesses. So obviously, identifying abscesses, you may need little more skills, but identifying liver abscess may be easy. So look for a, uh, put your ultrasound probe, look whether there is ascites, and look for any abscesses within the liver. So, so basically, this is a nice liver abscess where you can see a nice sort of a. So, if you have something like this, then some intervention has to be done prior to you extubating the patient, weaning and extubating. So, A is aeration, easy peasy. B is below the diaphragm. Main thing I would say is look for ascites and just put your probe in the liver to see if you are not missing out on any sort of a collection or in any other area. So, C. C, I'm sure we have done multiple videos on assessing cardiac function, but with regards to weaning, the suggestion is mainly look into the LV, look both at systolic function and diastolic function. So I have just kept it practical. Systolic function in my ICU, we always do EPSS, e point septal separation, very easy, parasternal long axis, put the M mod cursor and you get an image like this. Then you look at the distance between the septum and the mitral valve excursion, which is the E wave. And if it's less than 5 millimeter, it is normal. If EPSS is more than 7 millimeter, then your ejection fraction is somewhere between uh, 30 to 50 percent. And if it is more than 18 millimeter, you just have to remember 7 to 18 millimeter. Less than 7, normal. 7 to 18, uh, your ejection fraction is 30 to 50 percent. Less than 30, it is um, your EPSS is more than 18 millimeter. So very simple. And now the newer sort of ultrasound measure, you can uh, measure the LV systolic function very easily by looking to the systole and diastole and, and automated sort of a assessment of LV function is done much more easily in the newer ultrasounds that we use. But EPS is a very quick, it will take less than a minute to quantify your LV function. And of course, diastolic function, I'm sure many of the listeners uh, who are using ultrasound routinely in IC, you would measure, you would look into the mitral inflow pattern and you would look by E by A, deceleration time, and IVRT, intravascular relaxation time, interventricular relaxation time. So E by A is your, so what does E and A stands for? So basically E is early diastolic filling and A is atrial contraction. So we look into this difference and we look at the pulmonary venous inflow pattern and E by E prime, uh, basically we keep the uh, Doppler uh, at the lateral uh, mitral annulus and we measure the tissue Doppler to look at the filling pressure. So these are important to assess the diastolic function. I am sure most of you would have done this. You would keep a pulse wave Doppler with a sample at the mitral valve opening. So you would get a E and A wave. So you basically uh, measure the E by A velocity and then deceleration time is measured by looking at this slope and the normal is 160 to 240 milliseconds. And the E by E prime, you place the pulse wave Doppler with a sample at the mitral valve annulus and look at the tissue Doppler, you get a waveform like this, uh, where you take the first wave, which will give you the E prime. Uh, so I'm sure most of you would have done this. So I have a separate video on diastolic function. So the whole quintessence is A is aeration score, B is below the diaphragm, C is cardiac, mainly you look at systolic function. The simplest way I do in my ICU is EPSS. Sometimes we do a normal LV function. Uh, uh, you know, with uh, looking into the systole and diastolic waves and we look into the diastolic function, which is very easy. And then you look into the filling pressures. If you do these three things and they tell you filling pressures are normal, 
and you are uh, diastolic function, there is no severe diastolic dysfunction, then you know that patient is uh, safe enough to be extubated. So how do we grade? Grade one is E by A is less than one, and DCT is more than 240, and E by E prime, the filling pressure, what we saw, because filling pressure basically is an assessment of whether LA pressure, as you see here, is rather high, because if LA pressure is high, it sort of indicates that uh, the LV compliance is reduced and diastolic filling pressures are high. That's what it means. And grade 1A is where your filling pressure is more than 15. Grade 2 is E by A is 1 to 2. Deceleration time is 160 to 240 and E by E prime. So after grade 2, generally it is associated with filling pressures of more than 15. Sometimes it may be normal or low also, but if the filling pressure is high, then obviously you know you may have to diuries and reduce the filling pressure, then extubate. Otherwise, they will fail to wean well. And we do this every day in ICU. We keep looking at the diastolic function. We look at the filling pressure. We look at the systolic function in almost all patients. And grade 3 is where E by A is more than 2. Deceleration time is less than 160. And E by E prime is more than 15. So very simple. So I would say it would take maybe less than 5 minutes to look into the systolic function, diastolic function, filling pressure, which we do day in and day out. Uh, so there is a separate videos if you want to go through the detailing of all this. So this is part of weaning. You we do this anyway. Okay, then so A B C we finished. So A is variation score, B is below the diaphragm, C is cardiac, D is diaphragm assessment. A detailed video is there on diaphragm assessment in my YouTube. But I'll quickly run through what are the things we look at. You take a curvilinear probe or even a vascular probe. You put at the mid clavicular line in the subcostal region. So basically, you will see a diaphragm like a glistening sort of a structure here. So you will have diaphragm which moves during inspiration and during expiration. So end of inspiration, you take the diaphragm up, so it will be up and expiration, it tends to come down. So you get, you put a M mode cursor there, so you will get a waveform like this. So just a very simple. So you put your curvilinear probe at the mid clavicular line and you put an M mode cursor into the glistening structure you will get a waveform like this and inspiration will be uh, the, the top curve will be the inspiration and end of expiration will be the bottom one. So you look at the distance between the inspiration and so what it tells you, it tells you diaphragmatic excursion. How is the diaphragm moving with inspiration and exp uh, expiration? This we call it as diaphragmatic excursion. We measure the distance and distance should be more than 10. So if it is excursing well, it means diaphragm is functioning well, patient has a good ability to breathe and you are able to wean well. If it is not excurting well, if it is less than 10 millimeter, then there is a failure of weaning. So that's all it means, very simple. Okay, that is about diaphragm, very simple, any trick, there's no learning curve for that. Then we look at time for peak amplitude, peak inspiratory amplitude. So generally diaphragm wave looks like this. So if patient, obviously you are extubating and weaning, you can tell the patient to take deep breath. So this, see, if you see, this is a normal. If you take deep breath, there is a peaking. This we call it as peak inspiratory amplitude. The B1, you see, it's peaking. So here, so this is tidal inspiratory effect. This is deep inspiratory effect. Time to peak inspiratory amplitude is what we have to measure. Very simple. Again, you keep the M mode. You get a curve. Take a distance from here to the peaking. So the only difference is you have to tell the patient to take deep breath so that they take more breath. And then you take the measurement, the time taken for them to peak to this. You take the distance. And this is time to peak in spirit rapidity. I'll show you how we do it. So it should be more. If it is less than 0.9 seconds, it is non minable More than 1.2 seconds means successful weaning. So we have done it in our ICU. I'll show you. So this is in our own ICU patient. So where this was a patient with myasthenia gravis uh, who landed with a crisis. So we wanted to extubate. So if you see here, we have checked. Ask the patient to take a deep breath and we have measured the amplitude. And you can see the time here, it is 1 point, whatever, 38 seconds. And so, which means this patient was weanable. So, so the two things. Well, one thing is we look at di diaphragmatic excursion, then time to peak inspiratory amplitude, uh, which should be more. If it is less than 0.9 seconds, you cannot wean. If it is more than 1.3 seconds, you can wean. So, then diaphragmatic thickness and thickness fraction diaphragm is something what we do. So basically, we put the probe here in a different place. So we put the probe in the anterior axillary line. And then we look into uh, a position between the pleura and the parietal peritoneum. So we look at, so this is the parietal peritoneum. This is the diaphragm, this is the lung and pleural space. So basically, we diaphragm 
comes between the pleura and the parietal peritoneum. Obviously, the diaphragm is sitting, is separating the lung and abdomen. So you look into the diaphragm thickness between the parietal, identifying parietal uh, peritoneum and the pleura, and we take the thickness of the diaphragm. So how do we do? We have to put the probe, curvilinear probe, at the anterior axillary line. Uh, so there we put the probe in the mid clavicular line, the subcostal. Here you put at the anterior axillary line. So if you see, this is the diaphragmatic thickness, and this is the parietal peritoneum, and this is the pleura. And I'll show you in our own ICU how we have done it. So we use 6 to 13 hertz ultrasound probe, M mode. So diaphragmatic thickness has to be measured. Again, all these measurements have to be done in end expiratory and end inspiratory. And then we look at DTD is the diaphragmatic thickness difference. And that you take with the diaphragmatic thickness that we take during inspiration minus diaphragmatic thickness we take during expiration. And uh, thickness fraction diaphragm is this difference we take. So very simple, don't get perked up. You just take the diaphragmatic thickness during inspiration, expiration, you calculate the difference which is DTD divided by diaphragmatic thickness during expiration you take into 100 that will give you thickness fraction of diaphragm so not complicated simple and we have done it in our ICU. i'll show you if if thickness fraction of diaphragm is less than 20 percent then it means that patient is non minable and there is a diaphragmatic dysfunction very simple if it is more than 20 percent then it means they are winable so basically you get a curve like this so expiration will be up, inspiration will be down. And always remember, the easy way to remember is where the diaphragmatic thickness is maximum, that is inspiration. Where the thickness is very less is expiration. That's all. Very simple. You don't have to trace the inspiratory wave. Wherever diaphragmatic thickness is high, it is inspiration. And where the thickness is less, it is with the expiration, it is relaxing, thickness will be less. Inspiration, there is a work in the diaphragm, the thickness increases. So basically, you, so these are the measurements you do during inspiration and during expiration. See, this is the diaphragm, friends. It is between, always diaphragm is between the peritoneum, parietal peritoneum and the pleural line. And that is the diaphragm thickness that we take. And this is the end inspiration you take, which is less. End expiration, sorry, end inspiration is more, end expiration is less. So if, if you see here, so this is the end of inspiration. You see the diaphragm thickness is more. And this is the end of expiration. You see the diaphragm thickness is less. Very simple. And I'll show you how we did. So this is in our own ICU patient. We have done it. So you have taken here, this is the parietal peritoneum. This is the pleura. We have taken the thickness in expiration, which is smaller. And then we have taken this again during inspiration. And we have calculated thickness fraction of diaphragm, which is inspiration minus expiration divided by expiration into 100, 38%. I said more than 20% is winnable. More than uh, more than if it is less than 20 percent, then it is difficult to win. So, very simple, don't get put up. So, when you're assessing diaphragm, three things you look you look at diaphragmatic excursion, it should be more than 10 millimeter. Then, you look at time to peak inspiratory amplitude, it should be more than 1.3 seconds. Then, you look at diaphragmatic fraction, diaphragmatic thickness fraction, which you have to be more than 20 percent. So, that's all it is the thickness fraction diaphragm. So, these are the three components, very simple. So, we finished ABCD. A is aeration, B is below the diaphragm, C is cardiac, D is the diaphragm. And I won't go into details in this because even the review article I read, extra diaphragmatic respiratory muscles, they say you have to look at the assessment of accessory muscles that are breathing. I think this is little superfluous and even there is no detailing which accessory muscles that we need to look at with regards to measurement. And even the review article that came in 2020 in intensive care did not elaborate as to which all muscles we should look at. So we leave it at that because ABCD is good enough. E is an adjunct that if you are doing some research, you can do this. So, so that's about it with regards to the ABCD approach towards weaning friends. So hope it, may, it was clear. I'm sure all of you were doing all those four components, but we have just put it into an acronym and call it as ABCD. And E is extra diaphragmatic respiratory muscles. I'm sure you can look at sternum mystoid, you can look at intercostal muscles, so on and so forth. I think that is a little bit of an uh, exaggeration of our efforts. So I think we can limit to ABCD is my submission. So I request you all to submit your valuable work to Journal of Acute Care. So of course you can visit my website to react to this lecture. So thank you. Thank you. Very much.